Our gospel reading for this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from Matthew chapter 9 and chapter 10. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the, his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him, and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Delet, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is taken from our Gospel reading, and particularly a reading from verse, uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 1, and later on, uh, verse 8. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And later on, uh, verse 8, heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So where are you from? If someone were to ask you this question, how would you respond? Perhaps you might say, well, I'm from Chicago. Or perhaps if you're not originally from Chicago, like myself, the town where you grew up in, such as, in my case, East Grand Rapids, Michigan, home of the 38th President of the United States, Gerald R. Ford, those raunchy American pie movements. Or if you're from overseas, you might respond by saying you're from your home country, such as Mexico, Germany, or the Philippines, or else from the territory of Puerto Rico. By the way, happy Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican day, rather, to all my Puerto Rican cariño. But I wonder how many of you had heaven in mind when I asked you the question, where are you? For when you were born again through the water and the Spirit in holy baptism, your old sinful nature was buried with Christ in his death, and you were raised to new life in his resurrection. Consequently, you became a member of the family of God and a citizen of heaven, and renounced your citizenship here on this earth in its former sinful ways by saying no to the devil, the world in your own sinful flesh, and yes to God's rule over your life, and your love for him, and your love for your neighbor. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And so just as you tend to stand out as a foreigner when you visit another country, not just outwardly in your appearance, but in the way you think, speak and behave. So you tend to stand out from the other people of this world in the way you think, speak, and behave. So much so that it can cause others to marvel and say, where are you from anyway? You're different. As you live out the words found in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you, as guests and strangers of this world, stay away from the desires of your body because its appetites fight against the soul. Live a noble life among the people of the world so that instead of accusing you of doing wrong, they may see the good you do and glorify God when he visits them. Not that you go out of your way to be strange or nerdy like nerdy Ned Flanders of the Simpsons or to be different just to be different. But at the same time, when you find yourself living in a culture that is often counterculture to the kingdom of God, that you received, that you became a member of, and you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it shouldn't surprise you if you stand out from the rest of this world. For as Romans 12, 2 tells us, don't live like this world, but let yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can test and be sure what God wants, what is good and pleasing and perfect. When Jesus commissioned the disciples in our text, he sent them out not only to proclaim the good news of the gospel, so that others could know the good news, that the kingdom of God was at hand in the promised Messiah. He also sent them out to bring heaven on earth, wherever they happened to be. As the Holy Spirit worked in them, the will and the act and the word to fulfill his good purpose, thus giving them a powerful platform to invite others to join them in becoming fellow citizens of the kingdom of God by going and telling them the life-transforming message of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. For as you study the Gospels, you soon discover that when Jesus walked this earth, there is a pattern to his miraculous works, as almost inevitably, he would declare that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, followed by a miracle as evidence. And so similarly in our text, 
when he commissioned his disciples to declare the good news of the kingdom, he gave them instructions to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. And we have been called to do the same. Now granted, we may not see instant miracles of healing, or raising people from the dead. But the Holy Spirit chooses when such miracles occur. But ultimately, the gospel message is a message of health and complete wholeness. As the Greek word for salvation, sozo, literally means made completely whole. So that even though we may get sick and eventually die one day, because we have saving faith in Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, when he comes again, we will be raised with an immortal body that will never grow old, sick, or die for all eternity in heaven. In addition, just as the disciples in our text were commissioned to drive out demons, so we have been sent to drive out the devil with the power of the gospel message, bringing salvation to all who believe and victory over sin, death, and the devil. As well as making us victors in whatever spiritual battle we happen to find ourselves in on this earth. As we put on the full armor of God. To stand against the devil's wiles. And a belt of truth buckled around our waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. With our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to taking up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying in the Spirit on all occasions. Hence, 1 John 4, 4 assures us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world, because the one who is in you is greater. When we pray the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, that will be done as it, on earth as it is in heaven. We're not just praying that our Lord would come quickly and take us to heaven, although someday we might want that. But we're also praying that while we are still on this earth, that the kingdom of heaven might come through us as we do his will and share the gospel message with others. Moses received the king's orders on Mount Sinai. But you don't have to climb up a mountain to meet with the king of kings and receive his orders. For you can have an encounter with the king of kings and lord of lords wherever his word is preached, taught, heard, read, or attached to the elements of water, bread, and wine in the sacraments. And just as Jesus sent out his disciples to proclaim the good news of the kingdom to this world, so he is sending out, uh, us out to do the same as we are dispersed out into the various vocations of our lives, carrying, with us, carrying within us the very culture of heaven. But the problem with living in another place other than our home is that we begin to pick up the customs, accents, and ways of the culture we find ourselves living in. Perhaps you heard about the boy who had a parakeet and a dog, and he wanted to teach his parakeet to bark like his dog. So he put them in the same room together. Instead, he began to hear two chirping noises as the dog began to chirp like the parakeet. Friends in Christ, we're not as strong as we think we are. And so we're continually to strengthen and nourish our faith and affirm our status as citizens of heaven with the regular receiving of God's word and partaking of Holy Communion as well as daily reminding ourselves who we are and who we are in our baptism. Lest we end up losing our uniqueness as God's people and lose our saltiness. As well as by regularly examining our lives as to whether we've been thinking like the world, acting like the world, or talking like the world. Or are we living like the citizens of heaven that we are in Christ, thinking like him? like him and talking like him. If not, then now is the day of your salvation. Repent of how you have sinned and thought, word, and deed by what you have done and by what you have left undone. 
and receive the Heavenly Father's forgiveness, made possible through His Son's shed blood on the cross, so that you may hear in your spirit the very same words Jesus spoke to the woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, give others a glimpse of heaven as you demonstrate to others how you've been called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light in your love for God and your love for your neighbor. And by sharing the citizen altering news of the gospel message in a fallen world that is desperately in need of the kingdom of God to come. And many are wondering, where is God? In the midst of all this chaos, division, and strife in this world, more than ever, we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven and not hide our light under a bushel of conformity. People of God, now is the time to shine in the dark and troubled times we find ourselves living in. To stand out from the rest. For you are a royal people, a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords. With the help of the Holy Spirit, go therefore and live up to your royal status and your love for God and your love for others. As you declare to a world filled with bad news, the good news, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we pray the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. For there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith Jesus Christ. In our prayers for the second Sunday after Pentecost, we continue to pray for the family and friends of Bernice Weepking, who received Christian burial this past Wednesday. We also pray for the family and friends of Pastor Stevens. There will be a, a small service on family members uh, this Monday at St. Paul Canfield. And we also continue to pray for David Kranzberger. Chuck Novak, Maria Panuski, Catherine Wendt, my brother David, and my dad, uh, Dr. Vernon E. Wendt, Sr. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the church and her witness of hope to the world, that in every city, village, and home across the globe, the voice of the Lord may be heard by the faithful preaching of the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor in the fields of the Lord today, and for the Lord to raise up laborers for his harvest fields, that their work may be blessed, and that they may be protected and defended against the enemies of the kingdom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our synod and Matthew, our synod president, and for our congregation and myself, our pastor, and for the resources to accomplish what the Lord has given us to do, despite all obstacles and temptations, that united in the faith we may serve the Lord with joy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who come to the Lord's table today, that they may receive the Lord's body and blood in faith and rejoice in his gift of forgiveness, the renewal of their life, and the promise of the eternal feast to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live under the flag of our nation, for those who govern this country, and for the causes of peace and justice, that we may be all given grace and freedom to serve the Lord honorably and in accord with his word, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and hungry, for the homeless and unemployed, and for the oppressed, that the Lord would grant them mercy 
and that we may help to relieve their sufferings and want. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, that the Lord would grant them healing. For the wounded in spirit, that the Lord would make them whole. And for the grieving, that the Lord would comfort them, especially all affected by the ongoing pandemic and its effects. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who know the riches of the Lord's blessing, that they may cheerfully return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of a grateful heart, and give generously to many agencies of the church working to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dying, that they may have peace at the last, and for our grateful remembrance of all those who have died in Christ, that in the fullness of time the Lord may bring us with them into his everlasting presence, presence where sin and death will trouble us no more. Let us pray to the Lord. O blessed Lord, through Moses you called the people to yourself, and from you delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his sufferings and death, he has redeemed us sinners from our sins, and by his resurrection he has released us from the fear of death. Help us to live as your own people, doing the good works for those which we were created, and praying with confidence the petitions and supplications of our hearts, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.